Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from everyone joining from everywhere. Thank you for joining this day's TinyML talk on TinyML and the developing world by Pete Warden from Google. We'll go through our sponsors and strategic partners. Number one, ARM, DeepLight, Edge Impulse, Emza, Greenwaves, Latent AI, Hotel, ImageMob, Maxim Integrated, Quixo, Qualcomm, Reality AI, Seed Studio, Sinem, SenseML, SignSense, and Sentient. Join TinyML Asia, register through this link here or using the QR code. Um, the event will be from 9th to 11th November, 11.30 a.m. China time. The event sponsors are ARM, Edge Impulse, Emza, DreamWorks, Hot Image Mob, Latent AI, Qualcomm, Quixel, Reality AI, C Studio, and SenseML, Science Sense, and Sentient. In collaboration with Hackster.io, kindly register for the TinyML Vision Challenge, which is due on 17th September. Winners will be announced on 1st October. And if you have any sponsorship requests, kindly uh, submit your request to the email below. Next slide. This is the first event of TinyML Kenya. And uh, we have two committee members, Joseph, who is a research assistant at iLab Africa at Stockholm University, and Clinton, who is a co-founder of Lions Lab Limited, and also an aging Pulse ambassador. Currently, we have 132 members in our meetup group. Next slide. Our next event will be on 14th October, 2021, which will be led by Jan jong Boom from Edge Impulse. The title of the event will be Making Africa Smarter with Embedded ML. The event will start at 8 a.m. Pacific time, so register through our meetup channels. So today's talk will be led by Pete Warden. So just a brief intro about Pete. Pete is the technical lead of the TensorFlow Light for Micro open source project at Google and the author of an email book from O'Reilly. He was previously CTO of Jetpack, a computer vision startup acquired by Google in 2014 and has worked at Apple. He can be found out on his Twitter at Pete Warden. So maybe I'll just introduce Pete, that maybe you can take over for the talk. Awesome, thanks so much, Clinton. So, hi everyone. Uh, yeah, as Clinton said, um, I'm uh, at Google. I'm the technical lead of TensorFlow Lite Micro, uh, which is Google's, um, part of Google's open source machine learning framework. Um, and you can find it at tensorflow.org. Um, and you can also, if you want to follow along with these slides, uh, you'll see the bit.ly uh, link uh, down at the bottom. Um, so don't worry about having to, uh, you know, take any notes. Um, you should just be able to uh, load that up, hopefully. And TensorFlow Lite Micro is um, aimed at really small devices. Um, it's aimed at fitting the code you need to run machine learning models in less than 20 kilobytes. Uh, which is used for um, embedded systems and um, really constrained, uh, always on devices, as I'll talk about. Um, and I'm always available uh, for questions offline. If you want to contact me, pwarden at google.com, uh, please uh, do reach out. So I'm here uh, to talk about uh, TinyML. Uh, and you'll probably hear to hear about that because this is the TinyML series of talks. Um, and TinyML is really the idea that being able to do machine learning on really cheap, low power embedded devices can open up a whole bunch of really new and interesting applications. And one of the things that uh, I think is really interesting about TinyML is that it has a lot of things that I'm hoping make it a good fit for being used in the developing world. And what I'm here to do today is not so much um, tell you about a bunch of things that are already happening, but really talk about um, some of the early things that I see happening, some of the characteristics of TinyML that I think um, 
are showing a lot of promise for users in the developing world. And then really uh, spend a lot of time on uh, getting comments, getting uh, QA from uh, the domain experts out there um, to better understand what the uses actually might be. Uh, you know, I'm somebody who's coming here with a, you know, with a hammer um, that I think could be useful, but I really want to know um, what people want to do with these tools and how we can actually help make it uh, more useful. Um, I just don't have the domain knowledge um, to, you know, understand how this can be useful in the developing world. Um, so I really want to hear audience um, about uh, some of the use cases that you're thinking about um, and how we might be able to help with that. So when I'm talking about TinyML and EdgeML in general in the developing world, uh, what are some concrete practical examples? Um, one of my favorite examples that I've been involved in for a while um, is actually uh, Plant Village, uh, which is a uh, Penn State, um, a university in the US has actually been running this uh, collaboration uh, with uh, farmers in um, uh, across the developing world, but especially in uh, East Africa and in Kenya, um, to create an application that people can use on their phones, in this case, to actually point at cassava plants and using the images of the cassava plants locally on their phones, diagnose different crop diseases and give farmers advice about what they can actually do to uh, improve, uh, you know, deal with the diseases and improve productivity. Um, and one of the key things here is that this is not a web app because data connectivity uh, in a lot of these rural areas is not good. It's not um, always available, uh, especially out in the um, remote areas where some of this uh, growing is happening. And uh, it's also often unreliable and expensive. So all of this machine learning to recognize the crop diseases is actually happening using image recognition locally um, on a phone. So I won't play the video right now um, because uh, it's, uh, you know, it's a few minutes long, but if you have the slides, I highly recommend uh, checking it out. And there's another example um, like that previous example was using TensorFlow Lite to uh, run on a phone. Um, here's another example where um, Google has been involved uh, in a collaboration. Uh, in this case, trying to spot uh, illegal logging, trying to actually help um, indigenous communities uh, in the Amazon rainforest to uh, discover when uh, people are coming onto their land um, and logging, uh, logging the trees um, using uh, essentially, again, um, smartphones, but smartphones that are uh, packaged up with solar power and put up in trees that then listen out for the sounds of um, heavy machinery, the sounds of uh, chainsaws, um, and then use that uh, machine learning technology to recognize those sounds and alert uh, the local community to what's actually going on. Um, and there are a whole bunch of really um, interesting things happening out there. I found wildlabs.net has been a really good resource for gathering together uh, a lot of the work that's happening. Um, and I'm sure Clinton and a lot of the other people on the call could actually you know, come up with their own examples. And I'm really hoping to hear um, some more examples uh, from people on the call. Um, but one thing to notice is that all of these examples uh, that I've shown so far are using uh, smartphones. Um, and 
I'm talking about tiny ML, which is kind of an evolution or step uh, beyond using smartphones because while smartphones have a whole bunch of um, advantages, um, it's very, um, they're pretty straightforward to program. Um, there's a lot of resources out there, um, but they require a lot of power. You have to have comparatively large solar panels for them to run, um, which means both with the solar panels and um, the phones themselves, they're comparatively bulky to install. Um, and they're expensive. They're going to cost, um, you know, tens at least, probably $100 plus. Um, and they're not really designed to exist in these often pretty harsh environments. Uh, heat and moisture are going to be um, a problem with them. Um, but having said all that, they are straightforward to program. So I highly recommend, you know, getting started using this kind of approach. But TinyML offers the chance to do something that has a whole bunch of advantages over the sort of uh, repurposed smartphone approach. Um, the idea that you can actually have something that either runs on very, very small solar panels or even um, sort of AA batteries, a pair of AA batteries for a year. Um, and that can be small, um, that can just be sort of, you know, a coin sized device. Um, we often talk about peel and stick sensors. Um, and these devices can be um, pretty cheap. Um, you can look at uh, getting down to below uh, $1 um, especially if you're producing them in bulk, uh, and even things like the Raspberry Pi Pico and other devices you can buy at retail for sort of, you know, three, four dollars each. Um, and they're really designed to live in pretty tough environments. Um, the big downside is that it's a very different world programming these devices. Um, you don't have the same level of ease of programming that you do when you're writing uh, smartphone apps. Um, so while they have all of these really nice advantages, it can be pretty painful to get started um, programming them. So what sort of stuff can you uh, think about doing with these um, machine learning devices running on embedded systems? So we saw detecting audio, so detecting chainsaws. Um, I also really like um, voice interfaces. Uh, there are some uh, nice examples out there. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how you can actually use um, voice interfaces in different uh, sort of local languages. Um, detecting bird calls is another really nice use case. Um, you can also do image recognition. So recognizing gestures, uh, recognizing kind of accelerometer, like trying to actually do things around packages and logistics um, and using all the accelerometer stuff. And as I said before, images, you can actually sort of count things, count people, count animals, count uh, vehicles. Um, and then there's all sorts of other sensors you can feed in to kind of monitor machinery, to monitor power usage. Um, and while they are harder to program, um, the nice thing is that you can actually buy uh, all you need for embedded development um, for $15, um, at least sort of retail in the US. And uh, there are, um, free courses um, and a whole bunch of free uh, learning resources that you can access um, to uh, figure out how to uh, make progress yourself. Um, and so why do I think that all of this really interesting um, new stuff that's emerging uh, might be a good fit for developing countries. Um, well, one thing that um, 
is really interesting is that when there isn't a lot of overhead of legacy infrastructure, we've seen with smartphones in the developing world, there's often a lot of innovation as there has been around payments and uh, other you know, things using the phones. Um, just because there aren't existing solutions. Um, and these devices, they don't require um, network connectivity or a power grid to function. They're doing machine learning locally um, themselves, so they don't necessarily need to be able to connect up to the cloud or connect up to the internet to do useful things. Um, the costs of uh, actually learning to use these things um, are a lot lower than, for example, having to buy a bunch of GPUs. Um, and a lot of the problems that embedded ML seems to have a lot of promise for solving are really um, uh, very prominent in the global south, including things like you know water quality, water access, agriculture, um, medical applications, and wildlife and ecology in general. But this is the key thing that I want to understand from talking to people um, as part of this um, uh, meeting is hearing about ways that people are thinking about or already using um, ML on edge devices to address some of these issues in the developing world. Uh, because I can have all of these ideas about what might work, uh, but because I'm not um, there on the ground, um, it's it's all pretty theoretical for me. I really need the um, guidance um, of collaborators uh, who are actually uh, working on these problems to understand uh, ways that we might be able to help. Um, and I do also have uh, Rod Crawford uh, on the call um, from uh, ARM as well. Um, so it's not just, uh, you know, Google or me and our team who are interested. There's, um, you know, kind of a community of uh, people on the software and hardware provide, provider side who are really keen to see ways that we can see innovation um, happening in these areas. One of the um, things that I think is going to be really important is trying to help uh, on the education side. Um, the edX course that I pointed to um, a few slides ago, we've now had over um, 30,000 uh, students register uh, for that. And it's actually a free course, um, as long as you don't need the certificate. Um, and uh, there are also a whole bunch of resources out there that are free Python notebooks um, that you can sort of uh, grab. And because TinyML is designed for small devices, often the models are actually um, pretty small themselves. And that means that you can actually train them without having to have as much data and as much uh, compute power as you need uh, for uh, many other devices. Um, and the hardware itself uh, is comparatively cheap, um, you know, maybe only $15 or $25 uh, in the US. And getting started with all of this stuff doesn't require um, a whole bunch of uh, background knowledge. Um, it's possible to get uh, high school students um, with some familiarity with um, coding, we've been able to get them up and running and doing interesting stuff uh, within an hour or two. Um, and it's a very, very open field because this area is so new, there's actually a lot of research that can be done um, by people who um, have come to it pretty recently because effectively we're all newbies in this area. Um, so in terms of academic research, uh, there's a massive amount of opportunities that are out there. So a lot of these characteristics we found um, fit pretty well with um, 
colleges and education establishments in the developing world. Um, and we're hoping to see more uh, collaborations with them. So I'm talking about all of these potential opportunities, but um, am I correct that there are um, some really interesting uh, fits between this technology and the developing world? Well, we're trying to sort of prove some of that out. Um, if you go to uh, tinymlx.org, you can see the tinyml4d initiative, uh, which is um, around trying to build an academic network with colleges around the world, um, trying to do practical things like providing uh, material uh, from courses that um, I've helped run at Harvard and Stanford, um, and taking the slides and the exercises and um, a lot of the other material and making that available under a Creative Commons license and effectively trying to um, put together a college course on TinyML uh, in a box that um, instructors can take and kind of make their own um, and use, um, you know, it's both being used in the US, but, hope, you know, it's also being uh, translated into um, languages um, so that it can be used um, in uh, a lot of places around the world. Um, and one of the big blockers that we often run into when trying to build these ML applications in practice is having the data to work with um, and even just having the tools to kind of create the data. So um, we've been working with ML Commons and uh, the Common Voice Initiative uh, to try and come up with uh, data sets that can be uh, useful and approaches to creating data sets that can be useful as well um, for, uh, especially for the developing world. Um, so one example is uh, this uh, paper um, that we've uh, recently been working on uh, around uh, a multilingual spoken words uh, data set. Um, I had the Google speech commands data set, which um, included single uh, utterance, single word utterances in English um, that uh, you could actually use to train a small embedded device to recognize particular words. Um, I've been working, uh, helping out a team um, largely uh, based out of Harvard with the ML Commons group um, that is expanding that idea to uh, more than 50 languages um, and really trying to offer the chance to build um, simple, straightforward voice interfaces that can run on embedded devices um, for uh, a lot more languages. Um, and you can uh, find, uh, and you probably can't see the, read the um, uh, URL um, for the web page that you can uh, check this out on, uh, but uh, there's actually an interactive uh, demonstration of searching um, uh, some African uh, radio uh, recordings for uh, the word mask um, using just the audio, um, using this uh, uh, data set um, and some kind of unique approaches um, that the team has put together to uh, make it easy to recognize um, words from spoken speech. So we think that this can be uh, really interesting for a lot of voice interface applications. So, as I said, I don't know uh, this domain. I don't want to come in and start telling people what they need to do. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm British. Uh, we have a, um, a pretty bad history of uh, <laughs> coming in uh, and uh, telling other countries um, uh, what to do. I really don't want to uh, continue that tradition. Um, I, what I want to do is give the 
domain experts who understand the problems in the developing world, um, some tools that they can use to um, build solutions themselves. And as part of that, really helping to provide educational materials um, to get people uh, trained up and also just generally hear from people who are solving these problems, what we can do uh, to uh, provide uh, better support for them. So that's all I have um, from the slides. I'm really hoping to be able to uh, use the rest of this time um, to uh, have people share uh, what they've uh, been doing themselves and ask me and Rod and Clinton and Evgeny um, on this call uh, questions about, um, you know, things that they uh, might uh, need uh, um, help with. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand over to Clinton. Yeah, thank you, Pete. Maybe we'll just go through some questions that have been submitted on chat. So like the first question is, so can TinyML be used with AI federated learning? So I actually um, have had a lot of questions about uh, federated learning. It's a really interesting um, approach, federated learning, but it's, it's a very, um, it's an approach that is very useful if you have a bunch of labeled data where you want to be able to do training on device and then you want to be able to share the uh, results anonymously with some uh, central server. And so far, um, I have not uh, run across uh, many embedded applications or any embedded applications where all of those conditions are true. So at the moment, a lot of what we need to do, we've found we need to do to solve practical problems is much more focused around just running inference and not even running training, let alone federated learning. So in theory, um, yes, uh, that is an interesting approach, but it's, um, it's quite an advanced topic. Um, I would love to hear if people have problems that they need federated learning to solve with because that would drive us to put more effort into that area uh, but so far it hasn't been a high priority thank you for that response Pete. so the next question is when training for use case on constrained devices as opposed to smartphones do you need less data more data different training methods to avoid over pruning or other errors as you try to shrink the model yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, one of the things that helps is we're usually trying to solve cruder or simpler problems than people are on um, uh, smartphones. Um, usually we're trying to um, do something uh, around you know, for example, hey, is there a chainsaw or a um, heavy truck in the vicinity? And that is usually a lot easier to solve than the sort of problems that you often solve on smartphones, which usually tend to be around, hey, is somebody saying this exact word? Or is somebody, um, uh, you know, very uh, specific, and uh, much more targeted uh, problems. Or for example, in the vision case, we'll just want to know, hey, is there a person in this camera view? Because it's like kind of a sensor that's looking at a subway track or something like that. And we just kind of need to know, is there a person there or not? Versus um, exactly where the person is or doing like facial recognition or pose estimation. Um, so there isn't anything truly inherent um, that makes embedded machine learning models more likely, uh, you know, sort of 
easier, but it just happens that because we're so constrained by the sizes of the devices, the problems we're tackling are usually less ambitious, which means that we um, can often uh, use uh, smaller uh, data sets and kind of train uh, more quickly and more easily. Uh, that's kind of a long-winded answer, um, but I hope that kind of makes, uh, makes some sense. Yes, sure. So the next question is, can you send the links to the open sources, to the open source mentioned applications, for example, in the category of audio, of detecting audio? Yeah, uh, so if you go to the, um, if you go to the link um, to the slides, um, and then you actually find the tensorflow.org um, slash line slash microcontrollers URL, that actually has links to all of the um, examples. We have an example for doing simple um, speech word recognition, uh, so simple audio recognition, simple um, uh, uh, gesture recognition, and also um, detecting whether there's a person or not in the image. Um, so uh, you should be able to get those uh, through the slides. Great. So the next question, in Uganda and Rwanda, we are attempting to use TNML to detect Ebola. We do, we do that by reading the router echoes of individuals in buildings. So like uh, the person is asking, if you wish to learn more, you can email him at the national email, which will be shared. So Awesome. Yeah, no, I'd love to. If you could drop me an email, I'll try and uh, drop you an email, but my email is petewarden at google.com. Uh, please um, uh, do uh, drop me an email if you get a chance, Jose. Great. So the next question, what are the efforts of standardizing both hardware and software that goes on them to reduce efforts, stop learning curves and pain points? Yeah, so um, I would... Uh, mention um, there are some great services like Edge Impulse um, is a fantastic way of kind of getting started um, using uh, a pretty straightforward uh, web interface. Um, there's also a lot of work happening around uh, Arduino um, to actually make um, uh, deploying uh, a lot easier. Um, there's still a long way to go. Uh, one of the big challenges with the embedded world is that there are so many different platforms. There's like ESP32, there's Arduino, there's the Pico, um, and there's um, many, many more. Um, we're trying to have one ML framework that works across all of these, um, but... Um, a lot of the challenges we run into are just around things like interfacing with peripherals, you know, cameras, uh, microphones, accelerometers, and different build systems. And that's still pretty, um, pretty tough to deal with. Great. So the next question, we have a problem with the size of CNN models to be used in the microcontroller. Do you have any tips on how we can make the model smaller without losing their performance? Or there are more suitable microcontrollers for relatively large CNN models? So I actually um, did uh, recently do a, a short blog post on uh, PeteWarden.com, uh, which is my mostly, um, mostly sort of... Uh, a uh, dead blog, but I occasionally uh, post on there still, um, where I talked about one technique for shrinking um, CNN models by replacing pooling ops with uh, strides instead. Um, it's, uh, it's still very much an art rather than a science trying to shrink these models. Um, and I would recommend, I think we've got another question coming up about the Raspberry Pi, if you don't have to try and get uh, something out on battery power, uh, I would, you know, and I would just think about getting started with prototyping using Raspberry Pi, which is effectively a, 
you know, kind of a smartphone without the screen, um, uh, if you need to run uh, larger models and just kind of get something prototyped. Great. So the next question, Raspberry Pi has long been used as a cost-effective approach in building computer labs for schools in developing countries. Compared to TinyML hardware, Pi is much more versatile. Do you think it's better value of money to invest in general purpose platform like Raspberry Pi? So I love the Raspberry Pi. Um, it's a fantastic device. Um, I think it's a great way to, um, you know, learn a lot about uh, programming. I would definitely encourage people to uh, use the Raspberry Pi. Um, the big challenge is that because it is effectively a the um, the internals of a smartphone, it has kind of a smartphone's um, battery usage. So you're not going to be able to create a device that will run for more than a day or so without recharging or without requiring large um, uh, solar uh, batteries. So um, if you don't need that, uh, you know, if you don't need that ability to have something that can kind of be deployed anywhere um, and live on uh, a battery um, for, or energy harvesting for a long time, um, you know, use the Raspberry Pi. Um, but uh, there's something kind of magical I found, especially with students, about giving them something that's kind of, I'm just going to show the little uh, Arduino Nano here that's this size that you can just kind of like strap to a magic wand or something like that um, and have them start playing with, um, you know, moving from a computer that's a kind of a bulky object that requires a lot of power to something that exists in the world has really been um, pretty exciting for a bunch of the students I've worked with. So, um, by all means, use the Raspberry Pi. I love it. Um, there's something kind of special about being able to do these tiny battery powered devices. So, the next question given the constraints on microcontrollers, what tools do you recommend to evaluate and improve on the microcontroller performance by NML models? Um, that's a good question. I might actually, uh, Rod, do you fancy answering uh, this one? Um, Rod so, from ARM. Yeah. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Um, yeah uh, uh, Clinton, could you just repeat the question? Okay. Given the constraints of microcontrollers, what tools do you recommend to evaluate and improve them on the microcontroller performance of the NML models? Okay. Yes. Um, so, so um, let me start by uh, going back to the point Pete was making, um, uh, which was Raspberry Pi is a really good platform to to start with with, with prototyping. Um, with um, TensorFlow Lite Micro, um, what we've done there is um, uh, we've actually uh, put in a lot of work uh, to uh, take some of the operators that TensorFlow Lite Micro supports and actually optimize them for the ARM architecture. So um, uh, if you look at the TensorFlow Lite Micro project, you'll be able to find links that uh, enable you to build TensorFlow Lite Micro with this optimized library called Simsys NN. Uh, and that will enable you to get quite a, a significant performance uplift, but not just performance, but also power saving performance um, uh, on, on uh, any models that you might run with, with that. And then if you look at the, uh, the flow for, for TensorFlow, um, you, you can begin uh, uh, with, with TensorFlow, build your models, deploy it and test it out on something like the Raspberry Pi, refine it. And then uh, uh, there's, there's the opportunity then to uh, go further and then deploy it directly onto, onto these tiny, uh, tiny microcontrollers um, with, the, with the optimized library. Yeah, thanks for that, Rod. So maybe let's tackle the next question. Most of real life computer vision use cases, not just artificial use cases, require quite complex neural networks that just don't fit in the microcontroller RAM, no matter how you prune the model. 
do you think TinyML, at least for version, is ready for the real world? So it's definitely a big problem. Um, you know, one of the uh, things I'm pretty excited by is seeing um, the hardware catching up with um, our demands. Um, you know, there's things like, uh, you know, there's a lot of um, accelerators that are coming in in the embedded space. I think Rod could talk about the Ethos U55 um, that's bringing a lot more processing power. Um, RAM is not expanding uh, nearly as quickly, but there are some really interesting research things happening around uh, shrinking bit depth, which, for example, that helps you fit more complex models. Um, and we also often see um, what we sometimes call cascaded models. Um, so if you have a complex use case um, for computer vision, uh, a lot of the time, you can actually break that down into kind of two parts. The first of which is uh, kind of a comparatively simple computer vision model that you can run on an always on embedded device. And then when there's actually something interesting happening, uh, you can wake up a more um, power hungry, but a more um, uh, sort of capable uh, device to actually uh, deal with it. So for example, you can have a simple model that just looks out for, is there a person there? Um, and most of the time uh, it's just running always on and there's no people around. Um, and then if it spots a person, um, then it might actually spin up a, um, a uh, more powerful, something more like a Raspberry Pi in its power um, to handle things like doing gesture recognition, uh, which would still be uh, pretty hard to do on an always on kind of uh, embedded system constraints. So having this kind of cascaded approach, uh, we found to be pretty useful uh, in uh, production use cases. Um, so there are um, a bunch of, uh, really interesting use cases that are actually happening uh, kind of out there um, in production or getting close to production. So there's definitely some um, utility there, but I totally understand the challenges. It's still um, really tough. Yeah, yeah, sure. So we have another interesting question here about firing. So what's the battery life of recommended batteries to use? For example, AA or AAA or 9 volts, what is battery types that are available in the developing countries? So um, that's a good question. Um, I um, don't know what the most common uh, you know, batteries available in developing countries are. I was hoping that things like uh, AA or AAA uh, might be fairly widely available because they're often used in consumer items. Um, but I think other people would have to uh, sort of kind of answer that question for me. Um, I do sort of use, I think I've used roughly, I can't remember the exact calculations, but it's the right ballpark is using a pair of AA batteries. I think you might be able to get like a milliwatt um, continuous um, power for around a year or so. Um, so that's one of the reasons we chose kind of one milliwatt as the threshold for saying, hey, this stuff is really tiny ML versus, um, you know, just general edge ML. Great, thanks. The other question. Any plans to make more tiny ML demos for BBC microbit devices? These devices are currently, currently used in secondary school kids for programming classes. Currently, I found similar demo at a, at a link that has been posted. Yeah, maybe if you can answer the question up to there. Yeah, and there's actually, I've been really interested in the microbit devices. I've been talking to the team involved 
Uh, one of the challenges has been that there's um, uh, getting the uh, peripherals, um, being able to access uh, the peripherals that we needed uh, to be able to do this. Because from what I remember, they have a um, kind of a, not quite a microphone, something that's more like a um, sort of sound volume detector, if that makes sense. Um, so it wasn't uh, straightforward to be able to use that um, with our existing examples. So I'm keen on supporting the micro bit. Uh, we have been working with them to try and get access to more um, peripherals like accelerometers and image, uh, you know, cameras and microphones. That has been the biggest holdup. Sure. So maybe another question. How important is knowledge of DSP while designing tiny mail applications? So um, you can definitely um, do stuff without, you know, get into this without any knowledge of DSP, um, you know, signal processing uh, to start with. Um, you'll probably end up picking up some as you go along if you want to kind of dig deeper. Um, there are effectively sort of, you know, different layers of the onion that you can peel. Like you can just grab an Arduino library and an, and an Arduino nano board and just, you know, install the TensorFlow library from the library manager and then just use one of the pre-canned examples and get something up and running. And for that, you don't really need any ML or DSP knowledge. But once you start trying to create your own applications, you are probably gonna to have to learn, um, learn a bit more. Okay. So another question, how come the price is so low as $1? Um, so that's, uh, the price is low because um, these devices are designed to be sort of things that end up in your toaster or in your sort of washing machine or, um, you know, in your remote control. Um, so the whole, or one of the big reasons for the existence of embedded devices is um, people need really, really cheap, small computers, like super cheap. Like I think the average industry kind of industrial price for uh, embedded devices is now sort of, you know, around 50 cents uh, for the average one that's sold because they're just being used as components in devices, you know, in toys and things that need to stay uh, really cheap. Um, so almost everything else about them kind of flows from that. Like that's why they have such small RAM uh, is because they need to be really cheap and the um, power usage um, needs to stay really low as well. So um, essentially people start off with the price point and the sort of power usage requirements and then say, okay, what kind of computer can I build that will fit within these constraints? And that's kind of what we end up with. Okay, so somebody is asking, how can you build a career as an email engineer? Yeah, so um, it's such a new career, it's really hard to um, give general advice. There, isn't a, there hasn't been a really strong uh, career path. What I do recommend is taking a job that um, where people are building uh, something um, where you can actually apply ML yourself. Uh, like I found there's been, you know, or doing, you know, obviously doing educational courses like the edX course and things like that, but there's nothing like actually learning with real, trying to solve real problems with ML. Um, and you don't have to be an ML centric company to do that. You just have to kind of, you can potentially appoint yourself the ML expert um, at, uh, you know, at a team that's doing something else. Um, so I've 
I found that to be a pretty effective way. Great, so maybe just another question. Are there levels of TinyML with respect to how difficult it is to deploy a model of device? Kind of like how we have levels of autonomous driving? If not, how would you classify the levels of TinyML? Um, that's, that's an interesting uh, question. There's definitely um, one of the biggest constraints we often find is actually fitting into memory. So um, I often like the, the crudest, but one of the most useful ways to classify devices is, okay, how much RAM and how much flash do they have? Uh, like the micro bit only has, you know, sort of 16K of RAM and 256K of flash. Um, so that's kind of getting towards the smaller end. You can actually get devices with just, you know, a few kilobytes of RAM and flash, and that gets really, really challenging to get tiny ML on. Um, but there isn't kind of like uh, levels of autonomous driving. Um, so, um, yeah, the amount of space that they use is often what I think about. Yeah, so we are almost at the top of the hour. So maybe you can just tackle one question before we can conclude. So the rest of the questions and conversation are going to be uh, to be live on at the TangML forum. So you can follow up on that. So maybe just the last question before we can conclude is that uh, if there is a chainsaw or heavy truck in an area, what are the typical ways a person is notified with a embedded device? Will it be on a network? to alert someone. Yeah, and um, what's interesting about these applications is sometimes they can not be on a network at all. Um, you know, you can imagine something that's doing person counting, that's a device that's just kind of like sitting on a wall by a shop um, doorway. And, you know, the shop owner could just go over at the end of every day and just sort of look at the number of people who've come in and out um, and wouldn't need any kind of, you know, using a display and wouldn't need any kind of network. Uh, for this kind of chainsaw um, application, um, it does actually use, I think the one that Google um, helped with was using LoRaWAN. Um, I've also been really excited by seeing a lot of work happening around uh, satellite networks. And the nice thing is that even though the radio that you have to fire up to sort of send alerts uses a lot of power, it can use like hundreds of milliwatts um, pretty easily, uh, which is a lot more than you could afford to be running continuously on batteries. Because you're only firing something up when there's something important happening, which is hopefully, you know, only, you know, once a day or, you know, once a week or something like that. Um, and you're only firing up for a short time. The total power usage um, doesn't uh, really matter too much uh, for the battery life. Um, and some of these new satellite um, sort of systems like Swarm and other things um, and Blues Wireless is actually doing some really interesting work in this area too, um, with um, sort of a cell network type stuff. Um, they're really interesting solutions, and I think they're going to be part of the, you know, part of the whole package. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Pete, for that. So we are top of the hour, so we need to conclude here. So we have a lot of interesting questions. Most of the conversation is going to be concluded at the TIML forum, as I just said. And also, after this, we're just going to have an open discussion, so just stay around. So for now, let's just conclude it there. Let's thank our sponsors. So we have AMP, we have DeepLight, we have the Gym Pulse, we have Enza, we have GreenWaves, Latent AI, Hot, ImageMob, Maxim Integrated, Quixo, Qualcomm, Realty AI, Seed Studio, SenseML, SciSense, and Citiant.
So ARM um, is the software and hardware foundation for TinyML. Deep Light use AI to make other AI faster, smaller, and more power efficient. Ejimpa is all about TinyML for all developers. Emza is all about the AI on IoT, AGI for visual sensors. Then we have Portage for distributed infrastructure for TinyML operations. Latent AI, adaptive AI for the intelligent edge. Maxim integrated, enabling edge intelligence. We have Quixo AI, automated machine learning. Automated machine learning. We have Qualcomm, advancing AI research to make efficient AI ubiquitous. We have Reality AI for advanced sensing to your product, adding advanced sensing to your product with AGI, structuring ML. And we have SenseML, building smart IoT sensor devices from data. Then we have SignSense, Sentient for neural decision processors. So our next TinyML talk will be on 14th October, where we'll be hosting Jan Jongboom from Ejimpulse, where we'll be handling making Africa smarter with embedded ML. So thank you and have a nice evening, morning and afternoon from everywhere you are.